Yes, thank you. Perfect. And Michael, you're ready as well. <clears throat> All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today. Um, you might have noticed that this is a Zoom platform, but we do have your mics um, and your screen share disabled. We ask that you go ahead and keep your cameras off as well, um, just to help us navigate through today's event without a lot of um, interruptions. But we do hope that you interact with our, today, our speaker today using the chat box. And you can find that depending on your platform, either at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen. Um, and if you click the little button, you will see a little pop-up box and you can put information in there. Um, but if you put in any questions, we'll kind of focus those on the end. So feel free to put them into the chat box at any time. Um, also wanted to let you know that we'll be recording this event, but it won't be posted right away. Um, but if you're interested in seeing any of our past events or seeing this one when we're able to um, share it in the chat box, I just put the link on where that recording will go. Um, and so you can take a look at our past recordings or any of our other things that are up on that site. Um, one plug for our last seminar of the year, last seminar for 2020, that's amazing. Um, next week on December 17th, we have Daniel Gomez, you, uh, I'm going to mess his last name up, Michael. Uchida. Uchida, um, from the University of Concepcion in Chile, and he'll be talking about identifying knowledge gaps and key management goals associated with salmon invasions in Chile. So we're really, really excited to wrap up the year with a really interesting talk um, from Daniel. And again, if you want to see any information about any of our upcoming events, if you just use whatever platform you use to Google HMSC, scroll to the bottom of our page, our calendar of event is there and you can get all of the links and information you might need. Um, I also wanna put in a little plug that I am filling out the um, winter seminar schedule and I am short one. I need somebody to present on January 7th. So, um, and that's right around the corner. So if anybody has any suggestions for me, please reach out and we will fill that um, seminar date, January 7th. Um, but for today, our speaker has been invited by Michael Banks. So Michael is gonna do the introductions, Michael. Well, hello everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce a friend and colleague for almost 20 years now. Renee is one of Oregon's own, having grown up here. She began her undergraduate at OSU, but then, but then transferred to another university, Humboldt State, where she completed her undergraduate, her master's at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And then uh, between 2003 and 2011, she worked as a research assistant in a project, as a project coordinator for our Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station Fisheries Genomics Laboratory, uh, where she contributed to large international genetic baseline for salmon, and then coordinated the West Coast Salmon Genetic Stock Identification Collaboration uh, and Project Cruise, which expanded to work with California and, uh, and Washington. Um, uh, with uh, at sea research, uh, two at sea research projects uh, designed to improve West Coast salmon fisheries management. Renee conducted her PhD in, in my program at OSU. Uh, her main thrust was a dissertation project to investigate the genetic basis of iron mineral candidate magnetoreceptor receptor cells which are proposed to underpin animals' ability to sense uh, the Earth's magnetic fields. In 2015, she joined the University of Hawaii at Hawaii, at uh, Hilo, the Department of Biology as a postdoctoral researcher in bioinformatics and genomics, uh, where she has since remained. There she studies evolutionary genetics of plant and insect communities of Hawaii and is employed through the Hawaii Cooperative Science Study Unit. Today, she will present an extension of her PhD project. And for pastimes, as you can see in the background there, she enjoys spending time gardening with family, cooking, traveling, and since moving to Hawaii, has developed a passion for rock work and gardening. Thank you very much, Renee. Looking forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you very much, Michael. I really appreciate the introduction. And it's just 
wonderful to uh, see so many familiar faces and names on the other side of this presentation. That's a rare treat here for the Zoom world and, and our new um, uh, online forums. Um, so today I'm going to discuss a component of my magnetic reception research that I began at Oregon State and then continued at the University of Hawaii after uh, ending my PhD research at Oregon. And I want to begin with co-author acknowledgments of which, of course, Michael Banks here, a senior author, and he conducted and oversaw my dissertation research and then has continued to be a mentor for the past six years, which is hard to believe that I left that long ago, um, but we've continued to collaborate on a number of different items. The other people who've contributed to this project are Jian Dong Wei and Uwe Hartman. The two of those are physicists and they contributed to determining the physical features of magnetic cells isolated from salmon olfactory epithelium. Hervé Kaju, who also performed microscopy, and Michael Winkelhofer, who is kind of a biogeophysicist and provided project oversight, and then also performed some ferromagnetic resonance experiments. I put uh, that I'm submitting to Nature, Nature Communications. I actually haven't quite done that yet, but the manuscript is gonna go in today, I swear. Long time coming. So thank you all for joining today and I will begin. So a variety of animals from large to small, terrestrial to aquatic, undertake these long distance migrations in order to benefit from seasonally available resources. And migration is a complex process in which genetics, social cues and environmental conditions all play a role. How these factors interact are not well understood. And a mechanistic understanding of migration can help improve the management of these species by reducing the uncertainty for stock recruitment dynamics, fisheries productivity, including population augmentation through hatchery practices, and also predicting how species will respond to environmental change. In terms of magnetic or in terms of navigational cues, it's easy to conceptualize the use of visual senses to determine a sense of place and also time. There we go. For example, as the day progresses and the sun arcs across the sky, that coupled with the direction of the sunrise and the sunset provides a sun compass or provides compass directions. And together, the sun's arc and cardinal, whoop, something is happening here. Sorry, I think, okay. Uh, Together, the sun's arc and cardinal directions provide a time compensated sun compass. Night features include the Milky Way galaxy and birds are known to use the rotation of stars around the North Polar Star for that northward um, migratory cue. Additional cues include patterns of polarized light, landscape features, sounds and smells, and also the Earth's geomagnetic field. It's easy for us to understand how sight and smell contribute to navigation, but the geomagnetic field perception tends to be more difficult to conceptualize because we're not tapped into that sense. And yet there's strong evidence that many animals do use the Earth's magnetic field for orientation. And one way this has been determined is to measure the behavior of animals that exhibit strong directional behaviors. But first a little bit about the Earth's magnetic field. You can see shown here to the left that the Earth's magnetic field is essentially like a bar magnet. And then I show to the right what it would look like if you were to place metal fillings around that bar magnet. And what that does is helps conceptualize by, yeah, let's just what I believe. You can see the way that these kind of fillings align to that magnetic equator where they're basically running in parallel and then at the north and the south poleward parts of the magnetic field, they exit that, the, they're essentially 90 degrees to that location. And so if you take that over to the Earth's crust, you can imagine that these lines of inclination, as they're called, show as 90 degree angles here, and then they're flat here against that magnetic equator. And from that, organisms can get a poleward or an equatorward sense of direction. These magnetic lines of inclination are depicted here, shown on this map. And what that does is 
you can see like by the way that the contour lines go, these are predictable across the latitudinal range of the Earth. And then in addition to that, we have the magnetic intensity, which also varies predictably from the equator to the North and South Pole. And so together, those two different senses can provide what's called a goal-oriented um, goal migratory actions, where you have a position and a goal, and you basically can take a heading and you can head down. Whoop. I need to hide my mouse from myself. You can head. Let's see what's going on. Okay, so you can take a, a heading and a bearing and go towards a goal, but you have to know your sense of place along the way. And that's why it's called goal oriented. And I always laugh when I show this slide because I actually made it while I was a student at Hatfield Marine Science Center long before I had ever even considered moving to Hawaii. And I used this in a Markham, Markham Symposium in about 2013, I think. And so for these two different types of directionality information, you can get that compass direction information and then you also have that map magnetic information um, you can see here that the birds exhibit this compass direction behavior. And this was a technique for recording migratory orientation of captive birds that was developed in around 1966. And this is called an Emlyn funnel. And shown down here is like a little ink pad and the bird hops up against the side of this funnel and makes little marks against it. And then you can take those marks and then kind of convert them into like a magnetic vector. And this was some of the earliest evidence that was able to show that birds do have this magnetic sense because you could take the geomagnetic field and you could flip it or change that compass direction and the birds would have a predictable response. And so this is an example of compass sense. Now for the map sense, I'll use an example from the sea turtle literature. And so shown in the lower left-hand corner is a juvenile loghead turtle. And that juvenile turtle is attached to a sensor. Here inside of this tank. And then these coils around the outside depict magnetic field or like a, uh, electromagnetic energy that can be converted to change the inclination of the field to represent different regions of the globe. And so this little sea turtle was subjected to simulated magnetic fields that correspond to these different dots surrounding the Pacific gyre. And at each dot, like the, the magnetic field was set to show that area. And then you can see the orientation response is depicted up here. And that kind of funnel shows the directionality of the, the sea turtle. Now remember, this is a young one, so it's naive to migration. And this indicates that it not only has a magnetic map sense where it has bi-directional or bi-coordinate information across the globe, but also it's an inherited magnetic map because it's never actually gone through the migration. And the potential benefit to this kind of behavior is that if the sea turtle exits the Atlantic gyre, it gets thrown into unfavorable conditions and is likely to perish. So it's not really understood how it is that animals are able to sense magnetic field information. One model is called a radical pair model. And in this, you have two different um, proteins that are kind of working together. One donates an electron and the other accepts it. So here's our donor and our acceptor. And they think that the donor is actually cryptochrome. One of the, they think it's cry four actually. And and it goes over to another compound that's contained inside the cryptochrome uh, that's adjacent to it. And the speed of this singlet triplet interconversion, which is a quantum, basically a quantum reaction, is contingent on the angle of the magnetic field relative to the animal sensor. And it's believed that they might somehow process this information through a visual pathway. And so if you can imagine here, this is depicted where it's like that dark spot that is showing the northern area or the, the pole and then the south pole there. And then if you're looking to the east and the west, it has a different kind of a schematic pattern. 
And there's strong evidence for this particular mechanism for magnetic sends. And it's not, um, it's not in contrast to the, there's good evidence for this and there's good evidence for the second me mechanism as well. And that second mechanism is the iron mineral mechanism. And I show here a picture of a bacteria because bacteria were among the first organisms where iron minerals were actually identified as being produced naturally by tissues. And here, each of these little dots is an individual crystal. Each crystal has a north and a south pole and the crystals are fairly regularly shaped and sized and they're each surrounded by a lipid membrane and the formation of these crystals is under very strict genetic control. And together, when you have two crystals adjacent, like shown here and here, it amplifies the magnetic field. And so when you have a chain of crystals, what that can do is it pushes the bacteria into alignment with the Earth's geomagnetic field. I'm just checking the notes. I will sit closer to my uh, microphone in hopes that helps with the audio. Okay, so these, these crystals amplify the magnetic field and then pushes that bacteria into alignment with the Earth's magnetic field. So in a north-south position, and then it's believed that that helps the organism maintain its position in the anoxic sediment. So there's a selective advantage for that. Now, naturally, for an iron mineral receptor to be present in organisms, it requires for the receptor system to be present, there has to be presence of iron minerals within the organisms themselves. And so shown here are a bunch of different animals from which magnetic material has either been extracted or has been inferred through squid magnetometry. And I wanna highlight this turtle here because that's work that Anjanette, <coughs> excuse me, Anjanette Baker performed. <coughs> Pardon me. And so for each of these organisms, different types of crystals have been identified. In the bee, it's actually small crystals around eight nanometers in size. And then the sea turtles, they were quite, they were, I believe, quite larger. And then I will go into some of the evidence from birds in finer detail. And what I was trying to point out before is there's no um, conflict between this iron mineral receptor, receptor system and that radical pair system. They both probably exist in the same organisms and there's evidence for that, but I don't have time to go into that today. So evidence in favor of this magnetite or mag iron mineral receptor mechanism comes from a couple different lines of evidence. First off, we have birds and in birds, there's this ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve that when probed, a, a uh, neural response was elicited. So basically you could see the synapses going down in the nerve tissue. You're visualizing, you know, with electronic equipment. And so, and also the bird's beak contains iron minerals as inferred through squid magnetometry. So searches for the magnetic material in situ were performed by Fleissner et al. in 2007. And they published this research paper that depicts this magnetite based or this iron mineral or magnetite based receptor mechanism as having these little crystals positioned throughout the bird's beak, possibly allowing for these cardinal direction, cardinal directions to be inferred. However, follow up research conducted in a different laboratory led by David Pease determined through thin sectioning that indeed there were iron minerals contained in the bird's beak. However, those cells were positive for MHC, which indicates that they were most likely old macrophage cells, so like old white blood cells, and that it's just phagocytized debris that was left over in the bird's beak. And for that reason, there is no known magnetite receptor in birds. However, there's still strong evidence, even with follow-up studies based on looking at the nerves, probing those, and then through um, kind of severing the nerves or doing experiments with the nerves and blocking ion, like basically ion channels so that the birds lose their migratory directionality. So in fish, a different experiment was conducted by Mike Walker. And Mike Walker, he also probed the nerves of the 
the fish, he looked at both the lateral line and also the trigeminal nerve, and he was not able to identify any kind of a response in the lateral line, but he was able to identify a response in this trigeminal nerve, and again, the ophthalmic branch. So he, he probed it, and then he put in this DII tracing, so basically a tracer, and then he determined that this nerve was connected to the nasal capsule of the olfactory rosette. And it's, I put it a picture, where did my mouse go? There we go. I pictured the nasal capsule right there. It basically, it just looks like a hand, like imagine that, and each little finger is called a lamella. And so here is an individual lamella, like the tip of a finger, and there's this little tiny, tiny red dot. And that red dot was magnetite. And so from this, there's more evidence that the magnetite in the olfactory rosette is involved with magnetic reception. However, there has not been any uh, positive evidence that shows that individual cells actually respond to a magnetic interrogation. And in fact, if you look at magnetite in other organisms, there we go. So in, these are in uh, Atlantic salmon. There's magnetite that's actually present in multiple locations. And so in the ethmoid tissue, there are chains of magnetite that were extracted. And you can see like shown here where they're kind of blown up. Those superficially resemble the same chains as a bacteria. And then here you can see two individual crystals side by side. And that spacing between them indicates that there's probably a biological membrane that's encasing each individual crystal. So the, the casing and the crystal itself is called the magnetosome. And that likely it's from a uh, it's biologically produced. And from the lateral line, there were also iron minerals that were isolated. Um, they're around 100 nanometers in size. These are slightly smaller, more like 30 to 50. But because there's no neural response for the lateral line nerve, that's kind of probably not where the receptor is. And there's no kind of known receptor or sensory system within the ethmoid tissue. So that region's basically been discounted in the literature. So that leaves only that olfactory rosette as a candidate, magnetor, uh, a candidate magnetoreceptor site. So I'm gonna to switch to magnetic, magnetotactic bacteria for a moment and talk about the genetics because in eukaryotes, there's absolutely nothing known about magnetite production. So in bacteria, the crystals have been identified in phylogenetic, phylogenetically diverse groups. So the alpha, gamma, and delta proteobacteria and the nitrospirae. There's 106 named magnetosome genes and within kind of a magnetosome gene database, there's around 600 genes total. And many are actually homologs of each other. In alpha proteobacteria, the genes are clustered in gene islands. One of the gene islands is called MAM-AB, the other is GCDF, and the next is XY, and the last one is MMS-6. The nitrospira and the delta proteobacteria biomineralization genes likely also involve these ones that are known as MAN or MAD genes. And so from here, we have a database of magnetosome genes or magnetosome associated genes, MAGs, that we know are associated with, with this crystal formation in bacteria. But for eukaryotes, we have no information. And so the research objectives here were fourfold. First, we wanted to validate the presence of magnetite in olfactory tissues. We wanted to determine whether the bacterial magnetosome associated genes or MAGs have distant homologs in eukaryote genomes. We sought to identify candidate genes through differential gene expression of magnetic and non-magnetic olfactory cells. And we wanted to develop a genetic model of eukaryote magnetite biomineralization. So first, the validation. This work was performed by Jian Dong Wei and Uwe Hartman. This was a part of Jian Dong's, uh, his PhD dissertation. And he constructed a custom designed magneto, 
um, an atomic force and magnetic force microscope. So basically it was a new way to try and look at biogenic magnetite. Crystal extracts were obtained from Atlantic salmon and they were placed on a basically a material that you could visualize using this atomic force microscope. And the lines to the top or the different boxes, A, B, D, and E, those are ones that depict um, clusters. So these are like clusters of clusters of crystals. So each of these little dots is actually a bunch of crystals. And so here, you can see here, so there's an estimated around 100 magnetite crystals that are clumped together. And there's no like physical reason that can explain why these would be clumped together other than biogenic production. And so the, the bacteria crystals, when you work with those, they form chains like by themselves. And when you work with the synthetic magnetites, they, they demonstrate other features as well. And I have additional data to back that up, but I don't have time to go into that today. Here, this line, the little white line, shows the size of the magnetite crystals here, kind of like in a cross section. And so basically, most of the crystals were around 30, 35 nanometers in size, which is actually smaller than expected, quite a bit smaller. And they are probably right at the cusp of what would be considered paramagnetic and single domain, probably more on the paramagnetic side. <coughs> Excuse me which means that they would not hold a strong magnetic signal. It would kind of go right through them. <clears throat> but they would amplify a magnetic signal that, that would be um, applied, like the Earth's geomagnetic field. And then in G and in H shown here, we have two side-by-side um, -side images, one from an atomic force microscope field of view, and the next from the magnetic force microscope. And so you can see it becomes dark and that dark coloration indicates that there's a magnetic attraction between the tip that is being used to like exert that magnetic force. And if we go back to the work by Mike Walker, he and his colleague Debola et al in 2000 reported that in rainbow trout, there were these like clusters of magnetite in this tissue that was thin sectioned and embedded, embedded in resin and then looked at using a magnetic force microscope and an atomic force microscope. So this dark section here is that magnetic force and then you can see the light is the contrast and then here are the, the clusters. And then if you look at Jian Dong's, Jian Dong's work using that same AFM, MFM, you can see these clusters here and superficially they're similar. And I, I had actually not remembered this. It was Mike Winkelhofer who pointed this out, but it's pretty neat that they actually tally in terms of the physical features of the two different um, extracts, you know, even though it's a different species of fish and in different laboratories, but this independent validation speaks well to the presence of this biogenic magnetite. So next I will go to objective two I apologize, my uh, keyboard quit on me, so that would explain why it was going wacky before. Okay, so the second objective of this research is to determine whether or not distant homologs of these, these magnetosome-associated genes are present in the genomes of eukaryotes. This could occur through three different ways. One, eukaryotic evolution or convergent evolution. So there's, in which case we would predict no genetic similarity between these magnetosome associated genes of bacteria and then the genomes or the genome contents of eukaryotes. The second possibility is that there was a lateral gene transfer event that happened sometime after eukaryote for like the eukaryogenesis occurred. And in that case, you would see a subset of genomes that would contain homologs of these magnetosome associated genes. And the third possibility is this ancient primordial event where diverse taxa share at least a subset of these magnetosome associated gene homologs. And so to test these three different ideas, 
I took this database of all of these magnetosome genes, so 106 named genes represented by 597 sequences, and I performed a homology search against genomes of 13 eukaryote taxa. It's a little hard to see here, but this one in the upper left-hand corner, that's a Chinook salmon. And then I use some of the model organisms as well. So C. elegans, an ant because there is a good genome, bats because they have magnetic sense, that's pretty obvious, mole rats also, and then zebrafish for the model species taxa. I performed a bidirectional blast match, which would make it so I would only get one gene hit per gene in the database. And then I examined the patterns of which kind of genes or gene groupings had homologs. And I'll first show you an example of like no match. So here, to orient you to this table, the name of the gene is here, the unipro accession is here, and then all of these are named the same. So it's MAMQ or MAMO. These are the, the 12 eukaryote genomes, actually the archaea here, 14, and then these are magneto tactic bacteria, mostly from the alpha proteobacteria, but there's one nitrospira and one um, delta proteobacteria in there. And you can see that in eukaryotes, there's basically no evidence of this MAMO gene. And in magnetotactic bacteria, most actually don't have it either. And that is, it's actually not surprising because these magnetotactic bacteria genes are not universally present across all different genomes of all the different species because you know how diverse the different groups are. Now I'll show you an example of a fairly decent match. And so here, this gene is called MAMN. And among the eukaryotes, all of the uh, reciprocal blast matches hit this one accession, which is a delta proteobacteria gene, all the way over. And then here, it's in a couple of magnetotactic bacteria as well, which are hopefully represented in the database. And then there's a few oddballs down here, like there's kind of a second copy of the gene. This is in a different taxa. But because it's still called MAMN, I group it together. And so for here, I would have 12 out of 13 hits, which is 92%. And I used this as a threshold for my cutoff for determining whether or not a gene was, quote, present or absent. And so present, I assigned it, um, I just had to label it something. So I called it universally present. And then the other ones, I would just discount as not strong evidence as being universally present in eukaryotes. Hopefully that makes sense. If it didn't, because it's an important part of the talk, type a question mark in that chat. Okay, so this is um, an individual gene view, but we can summarize it by looking at the genes that actually had many matches. And so I used kind of a heat map graphic just to show how many genes were present in the matches. And so for example, here, you can see this MAD9 gene. There's three different genes in the database in the bacteria side, and almost every single organism had one or two matches to at least one of these genes. So like it would be, they can have three max basically because there's only three genes total for that reciprocal blast match. There's a few cases where the genes were missing in one species. So here, MAN6 is missing in fly. And then here's the MAM-N gene, that one that I showed you a moment ago, that is, uh, was missing in worm. And then in addition, I also added archaea, a Loki archaeota species, which is from the Asgard clade of archaea. And that particular species affiliates with eukaryotes in phylogenomic analysis. And so that was kind of a secondary way of looking back in history at the history of all of these, the history of these magnetosome associated genes. And there's 11 genes on this list. And these are the only 11 out of the 106 named genes that showed consistent patterns of matches across eukaryotes and also archaea. And so interestingly, I wasn't expecting matches with archaea because that would indicate a very primordial kind of gene transfer, but that appears to be the case. Okay. 
<clears throat> so on an individual gene basis, I just wanted to present what it would look like for like a really strong match. Shown here are five different taxa, eukaryotes, that are known for magnetic sensitivity. We have the zebrafish, mole rat, chinook salmon, bat, and bumblebee. And here, this x-axis is the length of the amino acid sequence, like the total sequence. And then this, the, sorry, that's y. The x-axis predicts the, uh, provides the percent identity of that match. And for a very old gene from bacteria to eukaryotes, these matches are exceptionally high. And only the genes, like this is one particular gene, I'm only highlighting the different matches that are to that particular gene in the, in the um, species genome. And so all these little gray dots, that's like the entire genome contents of all of these different eukaryotes and their matches to these magnetotactic bacteria genes. And you just see it's a sea of basically shaded gray. And so you can kind of view this line here where things are um, at the cusp. That means they're kind of towards outliers. And then you have these ones out here that are absolute outliers. And it goes in order. So these are zebrafish genes that match to this one particular magnetotactic bacteria gene. Next, we have mole rats. These are salmon. This one in red was differentially expressed, which I'll come to in a moment. These are bats and these are bees. And so for these particular genes, when you align them, they have a very high degree of homology. And there's a number of different domain or like regions that are conserved, super conserved between the magnetotactic bacteria and also the eukaryotes. So that's further evidence that we're kind of going towards the right path for identifying the genes that could potentially have the same types of functions. So for the genomic results, I identified these 11 universally, conser universally conserved homologs in eukaryotes, of which nine of 11 were present in the Loki archaeota. And five of those core genes are present in all magnetotactic bacteria that have been queried in any detail, and also eukaryotes. In in one case, there's this really particular interesting kind of pattern that shows up for this magnetosome, magnetosome gene island, MAM AB. Pretty much all of the MAM genes were in this MAM AB island. And so the ones that I identified were H, E, K, N. There were a few Ps, but it didn't pass the threshold. And A. And so it appears as though of all the different parts of this giant genome of this magnetotactic bacteria, only this very, very small, like I think it's 17,000 base pairs was transferred over into the eukaryotes. For the other um, magnetosome, magnetosome gene islands, there was very weak or no evidence at all that they were transferred. And then I found evidence for individual man and MAD genes, which also group as um, clusters in the magnetotactic bacteria. So our results indicate that there's an ancient primordial event that diverse taxa share at least a subset of these magnetosome gene homologs. And that provides us kind of a baseline for looking at other um, like the functionality of these genes and determining whether or not they are indeed involved in the magnetite biomineralization. So I just wanted to add one more thing here. So for these genomics searches, I also compared the Chinook salmon to zebrafish. And I looked at all the homologs. So like you have MAM N and then you have MAM N2. It's kind of confusing, but it's basically homologs of homologs of magnetotactic bacteria. So basically it's just a bigger gene set. And then I looked at the commonalities between these two organisms and these. And the reason for this is because as a model species status, zebrafish have, have a very well annotated genome. 
And so I could take the differential gene expression results from the Chinook salmon and then compare it to zebrafish and then kind of backtrack to identify the functions of the genes that are being differentially expressed in salmon. And so I'll show just briefly one table of the gene annotations. And I realize it's probably hard to see, but these are um, three different categories for gene ontologies. And here's like the first gene ontology category, protein refolding. So we know that magnetosomes are covered with proteins. Um, the fold enrichment is 48 times greater in this gene set of like the magnetosome gene homologs in zebrafish compared to the background genome contents of zebrafish. So it's a way of assessing whether or not something actually is um, functionally important and is, does it contribute to a biological process. And most of these were highly, highly significant. So for example, protein folding chaperone, that was 90 fold enriched in zebrafish. And then over here in Chinook salmon, it was 63 times fold enriched. Now these are based on the genomes matched to the magnesium gene database, not to, the, not to anything else. I just wanna make sure that's hopefully clear. But these do help to inform interpretation of the differential gene expression results, which is the next component. So for the differential gene expression experiments, what I did was I extracted the olfactory rosette tissue from Chinook salmon. I enzymatically disassociated the cells, and then I placed them on a magnet overnight in a, basically in a buffer that was kind of thick, it had a lot of sucrose. And then the magnetic cells collected at the tip of this magnet, and then through forces of gravity, the other cells sank to the bottom of the tube. I aspirated off the pellet and placed it in a little vial and then aspirated that pellet. And then I performed an RNA, -seq um, basically sequencing the transcriptome in order to determine differences between the two different tissue types, magnetic and non-magnetic. I also included data um, samples from muscle tissue and blood for comparison. In total, I had 661 million reads that I mapped to a Chinook salmon genome. And the sequencing depth for the transcriptome olfactory rosette experiments was, as you can see, much higher. And then we have these, the other ones were fewer, but plenty enough to be able to determine the patterns of gene expression. And I'm missing that. So we'll go to the magnetic, non-magnetic comparison. So when I compared the magnetic to non-magnetic gene expression profiles, there were 1,588 genes that were upregulated or upexpressed in that magnetic sample. That was at a false discovery rate of 0.01, but there were still 600 genes basically at an FDR of 0.05. And it's, it's pretty typical to use a 0.1 for a gene expression threshold. And what it does is it encompasses a broader set of genes for when you're doing the annotation process. So you're better able to get at the biological uh, functionality of those genes. I performed that gene ontology overrepresentation test, like what I showed you in that table a moment ago. And it pointed to anatomical structure in cell maturation and development, mitotic cell cycle, protein modification, and then bounding membrane of an organelle. So that looks pretty promising. And notable genes included iron binding, actin, and cytoskeleton, which is consistent with an iron mineral based receptor. And for a homology search, I searched these differential, differentially expressed genes to determine the number of matches to the magnetosome gene database. There were 18 genes that matched. The p value for this, using a one sided proportional test, was P0.088. So it approaches statistical significance, but using that P0.05 threshold cutoff, it's not quite significant. So the last component of the research objectives is to develop a genetic model of eukaryote magnetite biomineralization. And here, I just want to kind of delve into the timing of when magnetite started to be found in the fossil record, and then also when they believe magnetotactic bacteria first started forming at, through evolutionary time scale. And that was around 2000 billion years ago, possibly three, 
pardon me, 2 billion years ago, possibly 3 billion years ago, depending on more recent estimates. And then the origin of the eukaryogenesis was more like 1.2, you know, it's debatable, 1.5 billion years ago. And we know that there was an endosymbiosis event where we had the uptake of the mitochondria into the eukaryo, of course, it's a, a feature of eukaryotic cells. So the question from our data is, what does that tell us in terms of the timing of all of these events? And I want to highlight this paper here by Chang and Kirschfink, because a lot of the ideas that I have um, to fuel this project come from them, in fact. So like this kind of primordial gene hypothesis was originally theirs, but they didn't have any genetic data to add to that interpretation. And so here, I, I put together this figure. It's actually inspired by McLeod et al. But basically, this is our time scale in series of events. So here's three to four billion years ago. Here's the chemical roots of life. And around possibly three, like more than three billion years ago to around two billion years ago, these bacteria begin to biomineralize the magnetite. And we have evidence from the fossil record that shows that in accord. So it was you know, a very ancient event. In order for these magnetite biomineralization genes to be present in archaea, there had to have been some sort of a transfer event around here. Um, I don't quite know when, but or, you know, around two billion years ago. And then that Asgard clade of Asgard clade of archaea is believed to contributed to the eukaryote kind of arm of the uh, tree of life. And then here's our eukaryogenesis, and I put a box to bound around the area where there's a lot of uncertainty. And we know like this here is supposed to depict the mitochondria. We know that that mitochondria endosymbiosis was a very important part for eukaryogenesis. But I would propose based on what we're seeing in terms of the retention of these magnetite biomineralization genes, that there must have been something really important about those genes as well. And how that link, um, you know, it's obviously it's a fundamental feature of eukaryotic biology, and there's a lot to be learned about that. Now, if you think about other endosymbiosis events, the precursor to any endosymbiosis is this obligate host symbiont relationship. And there's several examples of kind of a levels of introgression of the symbiont into the host. So we have Wolbachia, which is of course an intracellular bacteria that resides in insects and cannot live outside the insect cell for any length of time. And then we have the zooxanthellae and like the corals. So symbiodinium and corals have this obligate relationship. However, there are free living symbiodinium. And so this is like at a different evolutionary level of dependence, independence rather. And so it's easy to imagine over time you know, way, way, way back then, that there were other types of endosymbioses or host symbiont relationships that ended up in endosymbiosis. So there is evidence for current symbiosis between archaea and bacteria, and specifically that Asgard clade. There's a case study of a magnetotactic bacteria and a unicellular eukaryote forming a mutualistic relationship. And it's, thinks, it's thought that they kind of help that move around. And those assemblages were found in Northern and Southern hemispheres. Here's an example of two bacteria that form together. One is photosynthetic and the other is not. And so there's kind of like bits and pieces of each pathway so it's just yet another example. And it's believed that this magnetotactic bacteria and this rotospor, um, the rotospirulaceae family, this particular member probably had like a lateral gene transfer event where they received some of the genes for the magnetite biomineralization. And they think possibly it has to do with UV protection. So that's just another example. So for potential research directions, we can actually visualize magnetite under a confocal microscope and shown up top 
is magnetotactic bacteria as positive controls. So here's the bacteria without any kind of fluorescence. We put a fluorescent label on. And then here you can see a chain of magnetite there with that little silver. And then from a different angle, it looks like a pinpoint. E. coli has no magnetite and there is no um, reflectance. And then this trout olfactory epithelium here, you can see a little crystal of magnetite in this daffy marked fin section. And this research was performed by Hervé Kaju. This holds promise for being able to utilize fluorescence tools and laser microdissection for performing ultrastructure analysis of putative cells if you can get fluorescent probes to co-localize to that magnetite. And possibly you could do gene knockouts and assay whether or not the organisms were able to respond or whether they failed to respond to a magnetic field change. And so that would help validate whether or not a gene was involved in that magnetic sensory transduction. So for a summary of results, we have microscopy, which validated the presence of biogenic magnetite and olfactory epithelium. We have genomics, which identified eukaryote homologs of magnetite-associated bacterial genes. The results are consistent with the uptake of these magnetosome-associated genes, in particular the MAM-AB operon, and then a couple MAM man and mad genes early in the history of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And likely that involved nitrospire based on the patterns of gene matches that I observed that are tallied in my tables. Transcriptomics provides a list of candidate magnetoreceptor genes and the functional annotations are consistent with having identified constituents of protein membranes and involvement in iron minerals. And 18 of the DEGs differentially expressed genes were similar to bacterial magnetosome genes and almost significant. I searched so hard for one more, but it wasn't there unless I changed like the criteria, which of course I'm not going to do. So the broader implications for this research is that the retention of these distant homologs in eukaryote genomes indicates they're a functional feature, a fundamental feature of eukaryotic biology the genomics and transcriptomics together is consistent with involvement in magnetic sense. And these results can help to elucidate mechanisms of migration programs used by long distance migrants. And what I found, you know, the surprise outcome of any research project is when you start in one place, which was transcriptomics and end up somewhere else, which is in eukaryogenesis. Um, it was a surprise to determine that these genes went so far back into the evolutionary history of animals. And it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out in the future in additional research. So with that, I thank you all for your attention. I also want to acknowledge funders. Um, Project Cruise there at Hatfield Marine Science Center was instrumental to supporting this research. And the West Coast Salmon Genetic Stock Identification Collaboration as well. I received a number of scholarships at Oregon State, in particular, the Mamie Markham Research Award helped um, fuel this research. I don't think it would have been possible without it. A number of people helped with efficient facilities and I wanted to just do a special shout out to Dave Jacobson, who's instrumental to all things in the laboratory and Pete Lawson at NOAA for providing a lot of research um, advice. So with that, I thank you and I am open to questions. I can check the cat chat and I can repeat the questions too. Great. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, for folks uh, that are listening, go ahead and put any of your questions into the chat so Renee can see it. Um, I just wanted to say it's really fun to see somebody who's taken the work that's happened at Hatfield to see names that are still here and active um, in your uh, acknowledgement slide and know that those folks have had such an impact on moving things forward. So that's been really yes. amazing to see. Absolutely. It's, it's so amazing to see how things come together, even years after you leave, you know. <laughs> okay, so Scott Baker asks a question. What's the role of epigenetic mechanisms in migratory navigation and specifically natal homing? So that's a really interesting question because that natal homing component, if you break navigation down into two parts, you have the long distance migration, which is like for, or say, a Chinook salmon that goes up to Alaska and then comes back to the Columbia River. 
that's like the long distance phase. And then you have that homing phase, which is more like they can smell the river, they're getting ready to go in, and then they go up the river and identify their natal region. And Chinook salmon in particular have pinpoint accuracy to their natal ground. And for that homing portion of their migration, it's primarily through olfaction, so a sense of smell. And then there's a visual component as well. And so in terms of the role of epigenetic mechanisms, um, to be honest, I've never looked into it. I've primarily focused on the, that longer, long distance out in the ocean component. Um, but if there's ideas for looking at epigenetic mechanisms, that would be a wonderful thing to try and figure out because that would really help to understand which exact genes are involved in that, that final homing route because that even is a question. So there, there's some ideas about like amino acid hypotheses. They're smelling the old fish that were in the river. Um, it's possible that they're smelling basically like the biofilms on rocks, um, but they're not quite sure about that. I don't think unless someone else has more recent information. Yeah, it'd be a great so, thing to study. So Scott, if you have other questions or if you want me to unmute you so you can ask an additional question, let me know um, in the chat and I can open that up. Mm. Seems like we just got another question, Renee. Ah, the bacteria, what might they need navigation for? And it is kind of like a swim bladder in the sense that it keeps them stable in the sediment. And so they, there's some speculation that maybe the magnetite crystals are involved in like a chemosensory system, but there's no strong evidence for that that I've come across. But basically, if you imagine you're a bacteria in the mud and you don't want to go deeper and you don't want to go shallower, you need to stay in like a very, like, you know how mud has sediment, like um, layers, and you need to stay in your layer. It helps you by stabilizing you north south to the magnetic pole, literally, like it keeps them like that. And if you, you can actually zap the bacteria and it flips their little magnetic poles and they'll swim the opposite direction. So it's very clear that they're using that for their little swimming kind of navigation with their flagella. Nice. Uh, any other questions coming in? Just give folks a second here to think about. That was a lot of information and so it's, you know, I know. For me, you know, a lot of this is new. So processing it and, and organizing it and being ready to ask a question. Uh, Scott, I will uh, unmute you. Hang on. Let me find you in the world. Um, and anybody else why I'm trying to find Scott, uh, feel free to type in those questions. Okay, Scott, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask the question that you wanted to. Thanks, Cinnamon. Yeah, I'm, I'm just such a slow typist. So anyway, <laughs> it's good to you know, hear your voice. Yeah, it's good to hear yours, Ray. Um, and it was interesting, the uh, confluence of input from Hawaii. As you may know, Mike Walker did his PhD in Hawaii and Jeanette was a master's student uh, in oceanography in Hawaii working on the turtles. And Joe Kersvink was a, a, a was a, a collaborator with uh, uh, with with that group as well. So anyway, you're you're in the right place. <laughs> I guess. Oh right, with Andy Dizon. I was trying to remember. Uh, oh, Joe, I think Joe and Andy Dizon. Yeah. So anyway, that goes back a long time. But my quick question was: mineralization genes are probably you know are are you kind of ubiquitous, aren't they? And so I was wondering if you know, what you're seeing is partly an overlap in uh, ancestral mineralization genes, some of which get maybe convergently or repeatedly re-fashioned re, uh, for, um, for geomagnetic sense. Yeah, exactly. And so whether or not these genes share a lot of overlap with the biomineralization genes of say like bones remains to be seen. And even with something like bones, you would think they have it all figured out, but they don't have a full suite of genes that they know are involved with that mineralization process. But certainly the bacterial magnetite genes like that, it's a matrix mediated biomineralization. It, there must be, 
if these genes, well, these genes are obviously conserved in the eukaryotes, whether or not they're also utilized in other forms of biomineralization is unknown. There's, um, for magnetite biomineralization, chitin are a model species, but there was only a chitin genome like just released and the annotations of those genes for the biomineralization process are incomplete. So they had some, they, um, they're not publicly available yet and the author was waiting for the paper to come out prior to releasing them to me. Um, but once those are available, I can do a cross check and determine whether or not they, at least with the magnetite in like the ones that I've identified, do they also show up for the chitin as being important. But chitin are different in that it's, it's extracellular. It's magnetite is being formed on their radula teeth, but it's not the same type of, of like intracellular process. So it's possible that they won't share much similarity, but still interesting. And then for bones, I'm hoping to get some really, a very knowledgeable reviewer who might pick up on some of the um, commonalities with the bone biomineralization, but it's a pretty hefty uh, set of literature. And so sifting through all that would require a pretty expert eye, in my opinion. <laughs> Maybe someone there knows how to do it. Ah, so a relationship of crystals to humans, for example, crystals in the ear. So that is a very good question. So we have things like the otolith. And if you think about the otolith and ear, well, so crystals in the ear are different, of course. They're actually on like a bed of gel and they, um, they transduce that sound information kind of like in conjunction with the gel. But again, those crystals, uh, I don't actually know whether or like how they are formed other than obviously they're not iron mineral. They're a different type of crystal. Um, and when I looked in the literature for the crystal formation, nothing popped out. Basically, I looked for bone stuff too. And I looked at um, otoliths and anything that I could think of teeth also, but I didn't pick up any immediate patterns. So my answer is, I don't know. Um, I would say if anybody in our audience has more information for Renee, sounds like she's open. Uh, oh, yeah. I would say contact her directly. Um, do you have your contact information somewhere, Renee? Yes, so um, I will type it. In the chat or? In the chat, if I can get my computer to. <laughs> some computer issues. While Renee is putting in her information, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. We are at our time. Um, again, we have one more seminar the, before the year ends next week. So please come back and join us. We're going to talk a little bit more about salmon in Chile. So um, we'll continue on this thread, but join us next week and we'll see you there. Um, you're getting, you're seeing people saying, so nice to see you. It's nice that you are recognized by folks that are here. Oh, it's so fun to see people. I wish I was there in person. I can sure tell you that. Darn COVID. I know it makes it hard, but I will tell you that you probably reached many more people than would fit in our seminar room <laughs> with this virtual event. So we appreciate that. Yeah, and okay. we wish you, we could join you in Hilo. <laughs> That's probably well, nice. more <laughs> All right, so you're, you're seeing your, your comments. Everyone says we miss you and we uh, hope you're enjoying the sunshine. And yeah, thank you. It sure is nice to see people. All right, well, if anyone has any further questions, by all means, please email me. And if you have any um, ideas, I'm, I'm always looking for new ideas. Uh, I can't fit them into this paper, but <laughs> hopefully some follow-ups. I think I see Michael waving. Michael, did you want to have anything? You're muted, but did you want to add anything before we sign off? He's also working two computers, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll give him a second. <laughs> Dave, did you want me to unmute you? Just saying hello. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Okay, everybody, I'm going to call it quits and um, we'll see you next week. And Renee, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see everyone. I like seeing faces. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, everyone. See you next week. Okay.